we've changed this presentation just a little bit for this audience. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about silver. You know, people, I travel around the world extensively, as you probably uh, know, and I talk to some of the largest fund managers in the world, and, and, I, and I ask them if they own silver. And you know, I often get the, the reply back, well, why would I own silver when I own gold? Uh, and uh, I hear that, you know, gold is a poor man's, uh, or pardon me, silver is the poor man's gold, and, and uh, you know, you don't really need silver exposure in your portfolio because you might as well just own gold because it's really the granddaddy of all commodities. Well, that is true, and, and, and gold is definitely a, a currency. Uh, it's the granddaddy of all currencies, and it should be in your portfolio, and I am a large gold investor. But most of my net worth is in silver. Um, the supply-demand fundamentals in silver are quite phenomenal as, as far as I'm concerned. I put First Majestic together back uh, 16 years ago. Uh, 2018 is our 16th year in business, and it's been quite uh, incredible 16 years. But you know, just some of the fundamentals of the metal itself, I think you know, most importantly to me is the, really the ratio of what we're doing today. When I put First Majestic together back uh, 16 years ago, there was legitimately a, a handful of silver companies that could call themselves silver companies. And what I mean by that is a company that has over 50% of their revenue uh, from the sale of silver. Today, there's very few left. Uh, we're one of the few uh, uh, soldiers left in the silver space. Uh, uh, we're mining as a global industry. Uh, for every one ounce of gold, we're only mining nine ounces of silver. Yet, we're trading at 82 to 1. You know, explain that to me for a sec. I'd love to listen to your reasoning. Uh, the fact of the matter is, silver doesn't show up in the headlines. You know, I, I came back from uh, the Bank of Montreal's big mining conference back in the late February. It's the largest institutional conference uh, of the year that, you know, we look forward to going to. And, and the talk of the, of the uh, seminar, the talk of the conference was uh, green metals, battery metals, you know, copper, cobalt, nickel, you know, and, and others, lithium, of course. And it's interesting that if you think about it, you know, you couldn't mine a Bitcoin without silver. You know, think about that for a second. You know, you couldn't even drive an electric vehicle without silver. You know, what is an electric vehicle? It's a computer standing on or sitting on a stack of batteries. That computer consumes three times more silver than a normal fuel combustion car. We're consuming, as a human race, over one billion ounces of silver annually and miners are only producing about 800 million ounces a year. And that's been dropping for three consecutive years. Grades are dropping worldwide as the lack of investment. First Majestic silver production has dropped as well over the last three years as the lack of investment. You know, silver mines are a lot rarer than people think they are. And it's really not showing up in the uh, headlines yet. But I think it will. You know, whether it's Sony or whether it's Apple or Tesla or, or Samsung, you know, you name it these huge consumers of silver will hit a wall where they just cannot source the metal. We're being approached today by uh, the direct buyers, jewelry companies, electronics manufacturers, directly looking for supply. And that tells me there's something going on in the marketplace, that they realize that there's a tightness there that's just simply not showing up. And it will, and, it, and that's why I put together a silver company years ago. I did predict $50 silver back in 2002, 2003. We have obviously hit that price. I never did predict that uh, we would see the correction that we saw and that would put us to where we are today. But nevertheless, we will resume that bull market. I think we've already resumed it. And I think that we will see silver far outseed gold over the next several years. So I implore you to look at the silver fundamentals. Uh, it should be part of your portfolio. Some technologies, you know, of uh, this presentation, you know, you getting to this meeting today, me flying to Europe from Canada, you know, would not be possible without silver. For us to go green and do all the things we want to do as the human race to get off oil and gas just simply would not happen without silver. To accomplish all the things that we need to accomplish and are trying to accomplish as the human race is going to going to require a lot more silver, a lot more silver than we're currently mining. And the only way that's going to be accomplished is if silver prices are much, much higher. We need silver prices north of $100 an ounce 
in order for us to achieve the things that we're trying to achieve as a human race. So if you go back, you know, in time, you know, the, the, the silver ratio really didn't change much until the banks got involved. You know, after 1971 through 74, uh, when, when the COMEX was structured uh, and, and uh, commodities started to trade uh, in the paper markets, um, you know, there was a fair pricing mechanism for silver. And uh, until, unfortunately, when the banks got involved and, uh, you know, the commercials uh, started trading the metals, we got into this time frame of these weird uh, or unusual ratios where we've seen ra the ratio is actually as high as 90 to 1 over the last 30 years. I think this will change. I think the supply-demand fundamentals of the metal will crack this relationship and the banks will be forced to uh, stop uh, trading the metal the way they currently do. You know, this was, uh, you know, interesting uh, uh, discovery, or not so much of a discovery, but uh, um, uh, Sir Isaac Newton back in the 1500s was asked by King Edward, you know, what, how much gold is in, this, in the crust of the earth? And he actually came up with a number of 16 to 1. And that's how the sterling was actually formed uh, in Great Britain back in those years. Uh, we believe as scientists uh, that it's around 17 to 1. So, you know, interestingly enough, 600 years ago, he was pretty darn right. Yet we're mining uh, 9 to 1 only. And I said already we're trading 82 to 1 right here. Every time we see this ratio, this is a 20-year chart, every time we see it get up to these levels, we always see ratio compression. When this chart is going up, that's when silver is underperforming gold. When this chart is going down, that's when silver is outperforming gold. Last time in, uh, when silver hit uh, $50 in April of uh, 2011, the ratio got down to around 31 to 1. We're mining 9 to 1. We should be 9 to 1. That's where the ratio should be. So I expect to see triple-digit silver prices over the next three to five years. And going into, you know, the flow of capital, you know, the mining sector, as you all know, I'm sure, you know, most of you are mining investors and you're probably frustrated with, with what's happening in the market. Uh, you know, the, 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 the hate on the mining sector is obviously there. The institutional money has been chasing the S&P, the NASDAQ, and, and that trade has made them a lot of money. And, and why not? If you're a fund manager, you know, wouldn't you be doing the same? You know, if you can go and buy, you know, Apple or, or, or whatever and, you know, get your couple percent a day, uh, it's pretty easy money, and, that, and that's really been the trade for the last couple of years. And there's some pretty interesting stats here. I mean, you go back uh, during the last uh, bear market from 1998 to 2002, when, when gold and silver finally started to move in 2002, you know, we had the NASDAQ crash. When you go back and look in March at the top of the market, when the NASDAQ hit about 5,000, we had those top five companies in the United States with a market cap of $2 trillion. You know, today, you know, you've got the top five companies at $3.7 you know, uh, back in March of this year, but it's interesting to see the difference between these ind industries. And looking here, you have the top 50 mining companies with a market cap of about a $1 trillion dollars and you see all the other companies there. Oh, we missed one slide. There was a slide I thought that was gonna be here, but what it does, um, let me just go back. What it does, it shows you, and I don't have the other slide unfortunately, but it shows you the top five, uh, heck no, top five uh, companies in the United States of a market cap of 3.79 trillion, and the top 50 mining companies on the planet have a market cap of uh, just shy of a trillion. And if it wasn't for these top 50 mining companies, these five companies here would simply not exist. Right? That's a pretty major disconnect. And if you look at the revenues, and we don't, this is the slide I, I thought was going to be here, but the revenues of these top five companies is approximately $600 billion dollars. And the revenue of these 50 top miners is about $600 billion. 
So the revenues is almost equal, yet the market caps are obviously quite disconnected. Yet, as I said already, that the, these technology companies or industry as a, as a whole would not exist without these mining companies. So there's a complete disconnect in the world you know, where we give the miners almost zero credit for what they do as an industry. And that has to change. And what will make that change is metal prices. And it has to change if we expect to go where we're wanting to go or needing to go. So, uh, getting into First Majestic, uh, that took up about half of my time. I apologize, but uh, I was told the audience wanted to uh, listen to a little bit about silver. So, I'll get into the company. We're one of the purest silver companies in the world. 65% uh, of our revenues from the sale of silver, which puts us in a pretty unique camp. You know, like a company, a company like Hecla, for example, 20% of the revenue is uh, uh, silver. Uh, Coeur d'Alene, you know, 30% of the revenue is silver. For a company to have north of 50% of the revenue in silver is, is pretty unusual. There's very few companies out there on the planet that are actually are in our position. Uh, all our assets are in one country. We have six mines. We're currently in the, uh, in the process of buying another mine, and I'll, I'll speed this presentation up a little bit. Our market cap is around a billion dollars. Uh, that's down substantially. If you probably remember when silver went from uh, 1350 to 21 in the uh, first six months of 2016, our stock went from four bucks a share Canadian to $25 a share Canadian. Uh, the market cap hit three billion uh, in July of 2016. Since then it's corrected with the rest of the market. Silver's come down obviously. Uh, it's now stabilizing, which is kind of a good thing. So the stock has been doing better over the last uh, six or 12 months but it did, uh, uh, did have a bit of a roller coaster ride in, in 2016 and 2017. But we got a lot of money in the bank, you know, 250 million bucks in the bank. Um, uh, we're very strong, making money, cash flow positive. Uh, and this is an acquisition that we're just working on. This uh, Primero Mines, I'm not sure how well this company is known in this audience, but uh, you know, it had a billion dollar market cap uh, back in 2010, 2011, at $8 share price. Uh, they ran into some challenges due to a very, very aggressive stream that's currently in place uh, on this mine with wheat and precious metals. Uh, this stream was costing them a fortune. Uh, they were just unable to make a profit at current metal prices, and they're backing themselves in a corner all, every quarter. They were losing money. Uh, they had to borrow money consistently from the banks just to stay alive. And eventually, uh, early last year, in early 2017, the banks decided to pull a plug and go through a process. We were invited into that process and it was a competitive bidding process that lasted quite some time. It took a year, it was very complicated. And we were chosen as the winning company. Uh, and one of the reasons for that, or one of several reasons for that, is that it's in the state of Durango, uh, uh, which is a very important state for us. It's where our head office is, it is in Mexico. Uh, we're the largest taxpayer in the state of Durango. We're the largest employer in the city of Durango. Uh, Durango, I can tell you the government of Durango is very pleased that we ended up being the buyer of this asset. And what it does for us is that um, we currently produce approximately 17 million silver equivalent ounces annually, or at least that's our projection for 2018. And this adds about a little bit over 10 million ounces of production to our portfolio. So it's gonna be our largest mine. Uh, it's 50% silver, 50% gold. And what we've done is we've restructured the stream. So the stream is only based on 25% of the value of the metal going out the door compared to over 50% of the metal under the current stream with, uh, with Primero. So that difference is huge. It's about a $100 million difference on a cash flow basis. So upon closing, which should take place in the first two weeks of May, uh, our, our expected closing date currently is around May 10th. Uh, we'll be putting news out in the next week or so once we clarify the, the exact closing date. But once that occurs, you know, we're going to have about $100 million in free cash flow added to our, um, our, our, our uh, cash flow for the, for on, on an annualized basis, which is obviously quite big. So it almost doubles the size of the company. You know, we're obviously very excited about that. So look for news on that. I think the stock will go through a re-rating. Uh, there's quite a large short position on the stock right now uh, due to the arbitrage between these two companies and, and just normal, you know, uh, uh, you know hedge fund activity. Uh, so that short position will, will have to be unwound. 
And, and I think over the first couple of quarters of us owning this asset and the market picking up on really what this does to us as a business, I think that uh, the market's going to fall in love with uh, what we've done, and I think the stock will go through a nice re-rating uh, uh, over the next uh, couple of quarters. So look for that as uh, uh, the business develops. So we currently have about 4,000 employees uh, in First Majestic, uh, it's Endemis, uh, the acquisition I just was referring to, we'll add another 2,000, so we'll go up to about 6,000 employees uh, in the next couple of weeks. Financial performance, um, you know, we're very sensitive to the price of silver. You know, on a cash flow basis, we're doing okay. As I said, we made money last year. Uh, we did take down a write down, uh, the Q4 of 2014, we took a $55 million write down just to clean up the balance sheet a little bit and prepare ourselves for uh, the future. Uh, but, uh, you know, for every dollar move in the silver price at current production levels, it's about $18 million difference to our bottom line. So, if, you know, if we, and you add Sandemus on top of that, that's about a $30 million change per $1 move in the silver price. So silver is very important to us. You know, we get $18, $50, $19, $20 dollars silver, uh, which I'm expecting to happen prior to year end. Uh, you're going to see substantial cash flows coming into our business. So the assets are spread around. You know, as I said, we're all in Mexico. We've, we're active in uh, eight separate states, so over nine projects. San Dimas is our 10th project in our portfolio. Uh, the portfolio is getting big. Uh, and uh, we're, we're now spending time actually looking to get partners for some of these assets because, you know, with San Dimas now coming into our portfolio, that's a big mine. It's going to take some attention. Uh, we're going to have to st start... Uh, taking some investments away from some of our other assets to focus on uh, the internal rate of return on some of the other projects. So look for over the next one and two years that this uh, portfolio will change slightly uh, with a focus on some of the larger assets. But we're a very well-respected company in Mexico. We're very well known, as you can imagine. We've been there, for, as I said, for 16 years. Uh, we know we're very plugged into the government. We're close to the government. Uh, we're the second largest silver producer in Mexico, which is obviously you know, pretty key. So going over, you know, this is just 10 years, um, but it's important to see, you know, really how I've grown this business. You know, I've built this business through acquisition. I'm not a geologist. I'm not an engineer. You know, I'm a finance guy, and, and uh, you know, I, 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 I take advantage of opportune situations. I've been able to build this business through acquiring distressed assets and bringing our talent and our money to the table and improving the assets and, and building quite an interesting company. I think we've done a pretty good job doing it, uh, but the last few years have been quite challenging. As I said many times in my presentations, you know, the entire mining sector has been, been distressed due to the lack of margins. You know, the, you know, in, a, in a low price environment, when, when the metal prices are dropping substantially, you know, budgeting for uh, development or exploration, when, when you know, every quarter you know, the silver price is you know, down a couple of bucks, you can imagine how difficult it is to manage a business like that when you don't know what your revenues are going to be. And, uh, you know, we went through that just like, you know, the entire mining sector. So we actually had to start reducing the size of our mines. Uh, today, we have uh, uh, four of our mines are actually uh, producing less silver today than they did a few years ago. And we did that on purpose because obviously we're running a business and we want to be producing ounces that we're making money on. So in order to accomplish that, you actually have to change your mine plans and change your business and so on and so forth, and that's what we did. And, uh, but now that's all reversing. Now, since 2016, the cash flows of the business started to increase quite nicely, and we're now start replowing capital back into these operations. So over the next couple of years, you're actually going to start to see these mines start to produce more ounces, which is going to be pretty exciting. Now, there's another slide coming up, which I'll address in a second, more along those lines. So this is the 2017 operating numbers. You see that um, Santa Elena there is obviously the, the standout. You know, that's our biggest mine. 50% of that is gold, 50% of that is silver. You know, producing silver at two bucks an ounce is obviously a pretty good thing. Uh, look at Terra, the smallest mine, um, and it, it's due to its size. It's got a higher cost, obviously, which does make sense. Uh, we're spending quite a bit of money there at Ligatera right now to improve that operation. So hopefully over the next couple of years, you see the cost there drop substantially. Um, well, we, we know it will as a result of the work we're doing today. 
And our guidance, uh, we put guidance out twice per year, every January and every July. This year will be a little bit different because with Sandeem is coming into our portfolio, we're going to restate all our numbers uh, in June. And we've beat our numbers consistently. I think, quite honestly, these numbers are quite high on a cost basis. Uh, the the, pub, the um, production here is 15% is higher than 2017. So we're actually starting to see the growth come back into the business, which uh, I'll touch on. And I see that I'm running out of time here. But uh, this, this slide is probably the most important slide in the entire presentation. So going back to 2011, you know, this is when silver hit 50 bucks an ounce in April of that year. And we're, we're, you know, we got all engines going, we're building a mine, we've got two mines expanding, we're spending a ton of money in 2012, 2013, um, and you know, silver prices are averaging about 40 bucks in 2012, about 30 in, in 2013. But, uh, but you know, unfortunately, in June of uh, 2014, silver prices broke through 20 and actually hit $16, and we started losing money in 2014. The entire mining sector started losing money. It was pretty distressful period. So we had to start winding down our business. We had to start looking for every place to save money. And uh, that's then when we, of course, re reduced capital. You know, there was no way I was going to go to the public markets and raise money at ridiculously low share prices. And we got out of that quite nicely. In 2016, it turned out to be a huge year for us. We made about $130 million in profit that year. And we re replowing all that investment back into the uh, mines right now. And that's going to translate into improved uh, productivity, lower costs, higher production, and we're now seeing that. So look for uh, increased production over the next couple of quarters as a result of this, re uh, re uh, uh, the, this new investment. And also, you put Sandemus on top of this, it's going to change the business completely. So it's going to be a pretty exciting second half of 2018, and 2019 is going to be pretty exciting as well. Mm -hmm.